This bird box we have right here is a soar rail. Uh, this is a bird that is really unique to the Jug Bay area and has been coming here for probably thousands of years uh, as long as the wild rice has been on the Patuxent River. And the Sora, uh, everybody may not have ever seen a Sora before, a rail, but everybody's heard the saying, skinny as a rail. And if you've heard that saying, it came from this bird and their ability to laterally compress their rib cage. And if you see, when you look at one here walking around, they're round, kind of plump. But when they squeeze their highly flexible rib cage in, they can squeeze literally to less than one inch in diameter. And therefore, the saying, through all the marsh stems and plants they walk through, uh, that gives them that ability to uh, just go through the tiniest gaps in the vegetation, such as wild rice. They've been coming here by the thousands. There's, there's nine species of rails in North America. The soar is one of them and probably the most abundant of that group. But unique features uh, that this, about Jug Bay, such as this wild rice abundance, is what has drawn them there. Uh, the food value to them during their long migration. They have the longest migration known of any of the rail species in North America, some over 3,000 miles heading from Canada all the way to S South America. Uh, Jug Bay is just a middle stop for them on the way to the south, an area where they don't breed, but they do come in here to, uh, to refuel and gain weight during this fall period from August till November. The, uh, what we have here, you look, when you look at the bird, you see it has a very short bill designed for picking up sp seeds. Having a long bill would not be as advantageous because the birds are trying to probe into the marsh to find invertebrates. This bird is strictly a seed eater, so having a short tweezer is much easier. Uh, you see the feet. The toes are about a quarter of the body length of the bird. Really long legs, almost chicken-like. Many people call these the mud hen or mud chicken. And it allows them to walk over the mud surface and not sink in. It's almost like having snowshoes in. So you can see the weight is supported by having those very large flat toes. So, and long, long toes. And also, the bird is extremely camouflaged. It's patterned color, dark brownish, blends in with the mud surfaces, little white highlights that break up its outline. Um, it's got a little triangular tail with light color patches underneath of it that they flick constantly whenever they're out moving around. It helps the other birds in the marsh find them and visual, keep in visual contact with them. They, uh, I talked, it's got bold vertical barring on the flanks of the bird that blend in with the vertical lines and shadowing effect it creates in the marsh vegetation, also camouflaging them from predators. And these soras uh, weigh about three ounces roughly, or about uh, roughly 80 grams, 70, 80 grams, and they are ext extremely secretive. The nine species of rails in North America are probably the most secretive group and family of birds left in North America, and that's one of the reasons I became fascinated with them, because Jug Bay is, is a, one of the highest concentration areas for soar rails in the mid-Atlantic region. All right, I tell you what, since they're so secretive and, and you're interested in them, what kind of stuff are you doing with them? I mean, what are, what are you trying to learn about them? Well, to learn anything about them, uh, and the, the population has declined tremendously over this last, this last several decades. They used to be hunted very heavily here. There were five, four or five gun clubs in this area that were uh, up and allowed uh, people to come out and pole in the marsh in a little skiff. I don't know if you can see this little picture behind me, but uh, the photographs, the little drawings show uh, what how they hunted them. People would stand in a small skiff and pull through the marsh and a shooter would stand in the front and shoot them as they flush. Now they're very tiny, not a lot of meat on them, but people could kill tens of thousands of them we believe were shot here. So that contributed to the decline, but also the decline in the habitat, not only here, but in the breeding ground has caused a decline. The wild rice in particular is one of the most important foods here for them and has declined dramatically and the birds have gone right down along with them. But you can't study them unless you can catch them. The biggest challenge was trying to catch them because they're so so secretive, they only fly at night when they migrate, and they stay in the marsh vegetation all day long, and one of the least seen birds. So my challenge was only about a thousand of these birds had ever been captured and banded up until about 1992. So since then, we've captured and banded over 5,000 of them, developing a technique using this trap you can see right over here, if you follow me over here. Um, what you see, this, is, this would be set up in the marsh vegetation, this trap and it's, it's called a cloverleaf trap and has a small box on the end to get the birds out of. What, what we designed here came up was a digital microchip message repeater that has the bird's voice encoded on it and you can program it to come on at the key time. So if we listen, you'll hear the voice of the Sora. Let's listen for a bit. These, these high pitched almost, almost sound like a squeeze toy when you hear them squeaking. This is the call they make. Because they're very gregarious birds, they are attracted to this sound. Here's another one, the Winnie call again. 
okay, as they're attracted to the marks. We have these, these run on a solar panel and a car battery. And when they come on, there's a, attached to this trap in the marsh grass, which is over 10 feet high in most places, this small funnel. The bird walks along a two foot high chicken wire fence, seeking out the source of the sound, trying to get in with other soras and will walk in here. So if you watch this, uh, I'll actually show one here now. So here's how the bird would enter the trap. As it walks along the fence, it would enter here and then walk through the funnel and zip into the trap and be captured in this manner. So after a while at being in there, let me just walk around the, the side here for a second. And it would enter the box and you see it just entered into the box and now it's captured where we can go over here in the marsh and reach in and get the bird out. And sometimes we might catch a dozen or more of these in one capture. Uh, one capture session. We'd have like maybe 12 sites, 11 or 12 sites, and one year we banded over 1,200. Now let's walk over here. I'll show you what we would do next to the bird and part of our processing because so little is known, no one really understood like how to sex these birds. So we've been trying to come up with a method, for example, measuring the bill length in millimeters or Coleman it's called, right like this, 20.67. This is indicative of a male. Also measuring the length of the metatarsus, the tarsus bone is another thing we've developed here to come up with, 35.4. This Everything's pointing to a male in this one. Also we would measure toe and a few other body parts. One of the really important things in looking at body weight and condition in terms of the migration, we weigh them. We put them in a small grape bag such as this and get a weight. So um, slip this shut, take this small scale, and clip it on here and weigh them in grams. So if we capture this bird again in a few weeks while it's still here, we know right now this bird is 95 grams, which is quite heavy for a sore rail, 95 grams, almost off the scale. So this bird, very heavy uh, and, and preparing itself for the migration. And another thing we've done, of course, we would band them. I've got uh, a band here to keep, so we can monitor them. The small U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service band, uh, uh, actually USGS, and has a number encrypted on it here and a phone number showing it very tiny, specially fitted for them, opened, already pre-opened, put it in here like this, and we'll place it on what's called the tibia tarsus of the bird's leg. This is actually equivalent to your ankle that we place it on. It doesn't hurt the bird in any way, and it'll stay on for the life of the bird. We've actually had these birds picked up as far away in Florida. Found, people have found them in their yards, seven, 800 miles from here they've flown. And we're pretty certain by also doing radio tracking telemetry, we see this small transmitter we have. This is 1.8 grams. It weighs less than a dime, tied on with elastic thread. We're able to attach it to their back, tying it through their legs and around their waist, and it stretches with their body size. And this small transmitter is actually weighs less than they can eat. And they can fly. We can track them hundreds of miles with this on there.